actually. Thank you so much for joining us here. My name is Tatiana Strelchenko. I'm the director of America Housecape. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you our guests, special guests from Texas Tribune. Um, they came here from all the way from the Texas. And Texas Tribune is one of the few member supported, digital first, non partisan media organizations that inform Texans about public policy, politics, and government. Um, my honor to introduce to you Ian Mitra, the editor of the Texas Tribune, and Julian Aguilar, the journalist. They will talk today about how to run this nonprofit media organization in contemporary times. And of course, you are more than welcome to ask all possible questions. America House is a space for open dialogue. But please remember that the views and opinions expressed by the speakers do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any agency of the US government. Thank you, guys. And the floor is yours. <laughs> I don't even know what we're going to say yet. It's going to be very disappointing. No. <laughs> so uh, thank, thank you all for being here. Uh, my, as as you know, said, I'm uh, Ian Mitra. I'm the editor of the Texas Tribune. Uh, we have a presentation here that we'll go through, but we want to keep this very uh, casual, so feel free just to kind of uh, ask questions as we go along. As something comes up, be happy to answer them as we go. Um, but we'll just, you know, our presentation is kind of an overview of the operation of the Tribune. Uh, and just kind of the, the things that we kind of focus on uh, with our journalism and, as, and with our organization. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself as editor, I oversee the newsroom. Uh, so I'm making sure that our, we're executing our strategic plan in terms of our daily news coverage, uh, in terms of our enterprise coverage, in terms of our investigative, investigative coverage. Uh, we are a news, we're an organization of about 70 people. And of that, about 40 to 45 people fall under the editorial designation, which I oversee. My name is Julian Aguilar. Uh, I am one of the original reporters. I started in 2009. Um, I started as a contract writer, and I, I make the joke that I'm like the straight cat they fed once and kept going back. So they were just like, well, let's just give this guy a job. And, and 10 years later, uh, I'm still there. And now um, I have my own office in El Paso, where I cover the border and immigration. Um, I'm one of three that's outside of Austin. We also have a bureau in Dallas that does urban affairs, transportation, and those issues. And we um, have a Correspondent uh, Abby Livingston in Washington D.C. Um, so we, uh, everybody mainly is concentrated in Austin. Um, and like I said, I cover border immigration and uh, I write about trade. Also, trade with Texas and Mexico is the main economic driver for the state. So when President Trump says he's going to close the border, uh, people freak out. And uh, even though he won't do it, it affects the economics of the region. So that's just one example of how um, the current president keeps us on our toes in our reporting. Um, mainly, I've been lately. I've been writing mainly about the family separation policy, where Central American Cubans, um, some folks from Europe, uh, a lot of folks from Africa, are trying to seek asylum in the United States, and they're forced to wait in Mexico. Um, some of them were separated from their children when they tried to enter across the border illegally, and um, unfortunately, the last three, four weeks, I've been busy with the, the shooting that occurred there the first week of August, um, in August third at a Walmart that was racially motivated. So that will tie into sort of policy areas that we cover. We cover um, everything, uh, public education, higher education, transportation, uh, politics, the state government, uh, criminal justice, uh, immigration, um, you know, sometimes we, we all have beats, but everybody kind of pitches in on the smaller, smaller topics, so. I think we kind of covered some of this already, but uh, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan news outlet, so we're, we're an NGO. Uh, you know, we were founded at a time when there was an economic downturn in the U.S. and a global recession, and there was a lot of pullback in terms of coverage of state government. A lot of the traditional newspapers and media organizations, which were you know were owned by for-profit companies, they were cutting back because of uh, layoffs. So they were cutting their state coverage. Uh, it was a direct result. So there was this gap because so many laws that affect uh, Texans in particular, or uh, for us, uh, there was not enough coverage of what was going on in state government. So this was. Founded as a nonprofit because uh, our found co-founders believe that this was what we did was a public service and people needed to support it as a public service mission. Um, we focus solely on state government politics, uh, policy issues, statewide issues, issues that affect Texas on a statewide vision. We thought we wanted to keep this a, as narrow a focus as possible. We didn't want to mi uh, mimic what other metro newspapers do because we thought our model needed to be different uh, because we wanted to, people to really know what they were supporting. We wanted to have a focus on what our editorial coverage was about. 
we were, you know, we produced uh, daily content. We produce about two to three pieces of content every day. Those are mostly text stories, but we also have a data visuals team that produce. They analyze data. They produce data visualizations. They create databases. We also have a, a multimedia team that creates videos, uh, uh, not on a uh, weekly basis, a little bit more uh, sporadically, but uh, you know, the three-person media multimedia team. Uh, our content is all free. Uh, again, it's part of our public service mission. We believe that no part of Texas should be a news desert. So uh, any newspaper, any news outlet can take our content off the website, republish it for free. Uh, that's what we believe is part of our mission to make sure that everyone in Texas has access to the news that we cover. Um, I mentioned data, and we also a big part of what we do is we hold events uh, statewide, mostly in, in Austin, the state capital, but uh, across the state to make sure that uh, people across the state have access to the officials they elected that represent them, to make sure that they're having uh, policy conversations on the is issues that affect them, and to make sure that they have a voice uh, in, in those conversations. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of, we just went over this, so this is just the more condensed version. Uh, non nonprofit, nonpartisan media organization forms Texas, engages with them, um, again, through public events, through our, um, through our stories, through many documentaries, uh, through a lot of data, a lot of interactive uh, stuff that we try to do. Um, and nonprofit, nonpartisan, we get asked a lot if um, we slant one way or the other, and I, I tell people that I don't know how much you guys know about Texas politics, but um, it's a Republican dominated state. So we haven't had a statewide Democrat elected to office since 1994. So um, some people say, why do you write, you know, only about Republicans? We don't only write about Republicans, but just the makeup of the state means that, I mean, the governor, lieutenant governor, speaker of the House, they call themselves the big three. Our two U.S. senators, they're all from the same party. So that also means that we get uh, some criticism for being too hard on them. It's like, well, if they're the ones in power, they're the ones that are making the policy since, you know, the last two and a half decades. So they're the ones that we focus on the most. Um, because Texas is so big, you do have pockets of Democrats. So, for example, Harris County in Houston is a a blue stronghold. Um, the border is uh, fairly democratic, uh, but a little bit more socially conservative than other places like Travis County. Um, but uh, nothing, none of that uh, influences. We don't have a slant one way or the other. Um, we do have some, uh, it's called Trip Talk, which is another site where people can submit op-eds on certain issues, but that's uh, something that we, we only edit it, but we don't contribute that as writers. We're all um, your, your average reporters that don't take the stand either way. Um, and again, statewide issues, policy and politics are the main thing, but statewide issues, like I said, a shooting isn't necessarily, it's more of a crime story, but that will, uh, you know, eventually turn into statewide issues on gun policy and, and immigration. So just a little bit about our business model, we talked about it a little bit. So we kind of, this from the beginning of the Tribune, we wanted to focus not on one source of funding, but as a diversified sources of funding as possible. So these are kind of the major buckets uh, that we wanted to uh, focus on. We rely on major donors, people who are able to give you know, about you know, a couple thousand dollars, more than that, at least uh, a year. Uh, we rely on foundations. These aren't just journalism foundations. These are community foundations, education foundations, foundations that support the work we do because they know that without us, there would not be this kind of news, this kind of information being uh, disseminated in Texas and, and done in a responsible way. We rely on corporate sponsorship. Uh, these are companies that are you know, in Texas, outside of Texas, uh, again, for the same reasons as foundations, believe in the work that we do, believe that there needs to be a forum to have these discussions, a forum to have this kind of journalism, to talk about issues that aren't getting talked about elsewhere, being addressed elsewhere. Um, the sponsors will also underwrite events that we put on. We put on uh, one event a week on average, uh, and that's, that can be in Austin where we're based, or it can be anywhere else across the state. We're gonna have something in DC down the line too, and these are, uh, either uh, uh, events with featuring lawmakers who are statewide or local lawmakers uh, in Texas and across, across the state. These are policy discussions about the various policy areas that Julian talked about before, health care, uh, criminal justice, public education. These are, we are convening lawmakers or policy experts, advocates for people in marginalized communities, these discuss people who aren't represented, you know, in their government or in a lot of these discussions, we're bringing them to the table in these conversations. And so, corporate sponsors uh, see that as a way to just kind of, you know, see themselves as helping further those conversations, which is why they're interested in supporting that. And we usually have multiple sponsors for various events. We uh, try to limit the expense of the events because we want to make sure that we can use that corporate support, that foundation support, to kind of further our. 
uh, events. You want to talk about the festival a little bit? Yeah, so we, like I said, we have smaller events all over the state. They're all free to attend. They're all free for any, uh, we don't lock out any reporters from other media outlets. We want everybody, even if they're our competitors, um, because we can't promote public awareness and, and public participation and lock out other media groups. So um, other reporters from the Dallas Morning News, the Houston Chronicle, from whoever, will go and sometimes they'll write their own stories based on our events. Uh, we have one uh, large gathering every single year. It's usually in September or October called the Texas Tribune Festival, um, where we have speakers. Uh, there's more than 100 panel discussions. So, for example, I'm moderating a panel on uh, Texas's relationship with Mexico featuring two former ambassadors and a congressperson. Um, we'll have something to deal with transportation, with environment, with women's health, with uh, abortion regulations. I mean, A, a to Z, you name it. And we just uh, confirmed that we have actually five of the presidential candidates that are running for office in 2020 for running for the Democratic nomination that are going to be speaking at this festival. So it, every year it gets bigger and bigger. And that has uh, a lot to do with our revenue stream. We offer uh, different levels of pricing, for example, for college students, high school students, which are you know studying and working, might not have enough money to spend. And our members also get um, early dibs on discounted prices. But that's a, a major revenue boost for us. And, uh, it, it gets bigger and bigger every year. We have it in downtown Austin. Um, all around the Capitol, we close off two blocks of Congress Avenue. And we'll have it that we'll have, I moderated a panel at a church uh, last year, so we'll have any venue that's willing to accept us so we can diversify the amount of people that can go. Yeah, quickly to talk about uh, the last couple things on here. Membership, uh, we have a program which, uh, you, you, it, there's not an official amount uh, that requires you to be, a, you know, to be a member of the Texas Tribune. It's a sliding scale, you know, you can denote, donate $35 a year and become a member. Um, you can denote, do, you know, donate hundreds of dollars and be a member. You know, obviously, it's, we have uh, certain levels of benefits with different levels of membership. Uh, uh, what we try to do for our members is have events that kind of uh, get behind some of the uh, policy uh, jour journals that we cover to make sure that uh, you know if the members get something special out of that. They're having, you know, we do a couple of documentaries, uh, maybe one or two a year. We'll do special screenings of those and invite members so they can watch the documentary early and then. Uh, talk with our reporters, whether it's Julian or other reporters, uh, just about the big beats that they cover. You know, we do try to do special, also special uh, events for some of our bigger donors, uh, where we try to do updates on this Texas legislature, which we cover every other year they meet. Um, uh, also various uh, uh, symposiums uh, that we cover, we try to hold uh, uh, special, you know, events for members. And we have a VIP reception for our, our, our members at the Tribune Festival when there are Know, advocates, lawmakers, officials from all over the country, not just Texas, coming to talk about politics, policy, and issues like that. And so there's there's an interest because of the access uh, that we're bringing by bringing all these people in to have these discussions. So that, those are the kind of the top peaks of for members, top perks. I'm sorry for members. Earned revenue is just a smaller piece of the pie for us. This is just direct sales of products uh, that we uh, produce. Uh, we have a, a political newsletter for insiders things that may not be of interest to a general audience, uh, but things like uh, whether it's rumors about staffing changes or you know, uh, little things within campaigns that are going on that you know, people, general Tribune audience uh, members wouldn't be interested in, but people who are insiders, lobbyists, they, they care about that stuff, so they'll pay uh, for a newsletter that we put or produce five times a week. We've also, uh, there's, uh, we used to have a partnership with the New York Times where we would produce a regional section um, uh, twice a week uh, for them, and they would pay us directly for that, con you know, for work for producing that content. Uh, a couple of other examples uh, for us: um, when Hurricane Harvey hit Texas a couple of years ago, our coverage on that was extensive and thorough, and uh, as well as our photo coverage with the freelance photographers we hired. And so there was a publisher who wanted to kind of put all of that material in a book, uh, just <coughs> so that the you know part of the proceeds of the sales of that book we were we took in. Um, there was an education textbook company that wanted to uh, take a lot of our coverage and use it in a, in a textbook for students and so they paid us, uh, even though the content was all out there for free, to condense it in a way that they could use it for these textbooks, they gave us money. So that's, that's a smaller piece of the pie for us. Uh, it's probably about 5% of the revenue we make while these other ones are bigger, but it's still kind of an, an important one as well. Alright, that's us. That's our group. So uh, anyway, we are based in downtown Austin. We this is taken in our in a studio that we have. You know, we now we, we now have our office space has a studio where we hold our events. Uh, you know, most of them uh, are weekly events. Uh, they we have a capacity for about um, about a hundred people in there, and so 
you know, this the studio space that we have is not only uh, there so we can use it for our own events, but now we're actually able, we're in downtown Austin, real estate studio space is at a premium there. We're able to use this as a revenue gener generator as well. We rent out our space for various events uh, and with the discounted rates for other NGOs uh, to use. So yeah, uh, breakdown of our staff. We're about 70 full-time employees. When Julian was there when the Tribune first started, how many people did you have? About 12. 12, yeah. Which is, so up to 70 in 10 years, not bad. So our editorial team, obviously we have uh, you know, about 15 to 16 full-time beat reporters. Uh, we have about uh, five or six to seven editors. Uh, we have a four-person data viz team, uh, multimedia three-person team. We actually have one photographer slash photo editor and a deputy photo editor. We actually hire a lot of freelance photography uh, photographers for, for across the state. We have an audience team that includes someone who's in charge of membership. We have a social media editor. We have an engagement producer. The engagement producer uh, focuses on, we have a Facebook group where we moderate mo monthly discussions on various topics. That person's in charge of that. That person also writes, we have a morning uh, digest of our, which basically sums up kind of the top news content that we're producing daily, as well as a roundup of other stories from across the state. Um, our social media editor is in charge of our uh, accounts, uh, making sure that we're promoting our content and engaging with our audience through Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit. Uh, we have a creative team that does a lot of the design work for not just the site, but also for a lot of the products that we put out. We have a lot of uh, artwork that we put out for their festival, so they're really involved with the graphics and doing, and doing all that. And uh, our events team, even though we put, on, we put on so many events, we just have a, three, uh, a, a team of three full-time people putting on the events. They may be the hardest working people in our organization. I don't know, it's, it's a tough call, but boy, they work hard. We have an engineering team. Uh, we support our own site, uh, and we also have our own internal CMS that we use, and so they're always making improvements and just making sure that we're secure and uh, you know, having good upload speeds on so when people are getting, clicking on our site, getting, on to, getting to our content, that they can get it very quickly. And of course, we have a development team. These are the people who are going out uh, and raising money for us, whether it's through corporate sponsorships, through foundation grants, uh, through membership, uh, membership initiatives with our audience team. All right, let's talk a little bit about kind of what we what we produce. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yeah, that was a lot. Yeah. Uh, yes, one little question. Have you printed version? We do not have a print product, which uh, actually works to our benefit pretty well because that is not an expense that we carry. Uh, but we are in newspapers all across the state because of the co because people can republish our content for free. Uh, uh, can you tell a little uh, about your competitors' m media background of the Texas? Oh, so our, about our competitors? Sure. So uh, you know the media landscape in Texas has been pretty traditional. There's a lot of uh, legacy uh, newspapers. In the biggest ones are in the big cities, Houston. Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, El Paso, and they have kind of more of a traditional business model where the, most of their uh, income is derived from, uh, from advertising and subscriptions from the, from the print product. So the challenge for them is how to monetize their online product mm -hmm. at a time when fewer people are taking subscriptions. So the challenge for them is to kind of put more resources and energy into, those, uh, into the online product while at the same time the, the money maker for them is still the print advertising, so that's a struggle for them. Uh, all, most of the newspapers that I just mentioned, they have some presence in Austin, so they're, co they're covering state government in some form or fashion, so they're chasing a lot of the same stories we are. They do not have as many people as we do focused on state coverage of these various issues. You know, for the, the largest bureau covering state government outside of us, you know, we have 16 full-time reporters, is probably the Dallas Morning News, which has maybe five or six reporters in their staff. Uh, in, in their bureau, in their capital bureau. That said, they have a much bigger newsroom than we do. They have more resources in their local cities, so they could be, if there's a big story coming out of Austin, they can dedicate far more people than we can to a specific issue. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our CEO likes to say we don't have any competitors, we just have future collaborators. He says that, but I think we still see them as, com as competition, because uh, we're, all, we're all chasing the same stories, and so, uh, 
And so in the TV stations, there are, you know, the TV stations uh, in, te in Texas tend to focus more on local news, on metro news. There's not a, a media organization that really focuses on the state government the way we do. So we don't, they're not as, they, they're not chasing as many of the same stories as we are. And, oh, I'm sorry, there probably are a couple of other statewide organizations we should talk about. So. No, well, I was going to say about the television stations, we do collaborate with them. Sometimes they'll, they'll, um, you know, I'll, I'll go into the studio and I'll pass it to talk about an issue that we covered, or sometimes they'll we'll use Skype or some other forms to, of, of uh, technology to go from our newsroom to the Dallas area and things like that. So, like I said, they, we, they do compete with us, but they are also our, our partners. I should mention there are a couple of other statewide organizations. There's the Texas Observer, which has uh, been around for several, you know, a few dec several decades, and they cover state uh, uh, state issues, uh, but they're more focused on long-form journalism. We tend to be a little bit more focused on uh, more daily and enterprise, but they, they don't have as uh, much of a turn as we do. They don't. They have a print product, but it's more of a uh, like a weekly magazine, I think, uh, feature, not necessarily, you know, they, they cover news daily on their website. Um, and then there's also Texas Monthly, which is a magazine um, that's based in Austin that covers uh, state issues. Um, they have more of like a, more of a culture and politics focus, and so they, uh, they're not as focused on the news and policy aspects as we are, but they do cover the state politics. Plus, they have the one job that everyone in Texas is jealous of. They have a barbecue editor. Um, so that's what we all aspire to in journalism in Texas, is to be the barbecue editor. You had a question, sir? Yeah, I had a question about the CMS, since I'm a programmer, but maybe not be as interesting as you <laughs> Well, please, go. How many years? So this is an in-house product that yes. you have built incrementally to suit your needs. <clears throat> Don't you sell it as a CMS? You know, it was originally funded in, in partnership with a couple of other nonprofits to eventually maybe see it as a way to sell the, uh, the CMS, uh, but uh, it was, it didn't end up taking off that, in that way to where it was, there was a lot of interest because a lot of, it, it needed to be uh, individualized so much for, for different uh, publications, so yeah, it didn't. Is it open source, what's the name, if I can? It's just an internal, it's not, the, the, the CMS itself is an open source. I don't think we even have a name for it. It was part of something called the Armstrong Project, mm -hmm. which I don't remember if that part of it was, like the original CMS code was open source. Now everything is internal. We don't really do anything outside. I can find out more about the CMS. I don't know specifically about the open source of the coding for the current CMS, but I can ask. That's really interesting. And of all those 80 plus people on the staff, are they full time or? Yeah. And if, if if all of them are full time, don't you bring the you know volunteer editors willing to cover some or on some occasion? Maybe some specialized writer who would like to offer you the content for free. Oh, I mean, all these questions. Uh, so we, we were on a well, purely volunteer television uh, during my run, so there's been much of you and Michael and Bruce. Yeah. And we were person is, and all of the staff was volunteers, so we had uh, my moral principle the free cash. <laughs> People coming from the job and then taking up the streaming uh, harness and, and just roaming the protest. So that was purely volunteer based. And that was with all with all its uh, you know deficiencies that had many advantages and I think that despite the people's volunteer it, it was able to keep the media up and running for I believe three months. So do you practice such items or all of the stuff you employ is uh, full time uh, and limited to those eight people? Yeah, so we have 70 full time uh, employees. Those are all uh, employed by the Tribune. We rely, we don't, we rely on freelance for photography and some video work. Uh, so we will work with freelancers there. Do you pay them? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we have freelance rates that we pay for those people. And you, and people offer you materials regardless of the visual or text for free. Do you accept such? Uh, there's people. There may be some that offer. We, you know, we, uh, we re all the 
content that we rely on our site has to be edited by our staff or produced by our staff, uh -huh. except for the uh, photo and uh, videos and, and video, which we, we our edit our full time editors work with uh, some freelance journalists on that. And it's the issue of financing. I, I didn't respond. Uh, there is not even a mention of combining it as like Google ads. Oh, that's through <coughs> that's through our uh, corporate sponsorship. Is you know we have ads on the site. Uh -huh. So that place. Yeah. So there's there's ads. Yes. Yeah. So it's the corporate uh, sponsorship includes having ads on the site. And, and just a small remarks. So th this is a presentation was on how to run a successful local media. Local in, in Ukrainian terms means that it's uh, like a county or right, a newspaper, maybe a municipal newspaper. Whereas you, your coverage is Texas wide, and the population of Texas is 28 million people, which is, I think you, you should be claiming that you're nationwide media <laughs> rather than local. That's well, just a remark. Okay, Sh statewide, yeah. <laughs> yeah so you, you can. Uh, so uh, what the topics we cover, just to get a little bit more details, these are uh, a lot of good examples. Um, this is a, a lead story, not, not so much the most popular story on the site, but we'll switch out the, the lead story in the well. Um, this is from March of, of earlier this year, March of 2019. Um, so again, the president keeps us on our toes. He's going to do this or do that to get his border wall built, but there's legal hurdles, so this is what the top story is about. If you look at our trending topics, uh, the one on the far left is the former president of the University of Texas, which is based in Austin. It's a flagship for the entire UT system. He passed away, and although we don't cover obituaries like a local newspaper, we, we don't cover uh, obituaries, we don't do sports, we don't do weather, we don't do the traditional crime beat like listen to the police scanner. Um, this, is, uh, this was uh, our story because he was the president of the flagship university, which is state-funded, um, which is one of our beats on higher education. Um, turning next, uh, Beto O'Rourke, uh, Congress, former congressman from El Paso, who unsuccessfully ran for U.S. Senate. A you know, big announcement is coming from Beto O'Rourke, so everybody now knows that it was to, to run for president. Um, again, the, the middle story is, is something also that has to deal with um, presidential announcements. And then these last two are our legislative coverage uh, for the Texas Senate. The Texas Senate uh, passes this. Um, and this is the, because it's in the middle of March, we're just keeping people updated on the process because a lot can change in the legislative process. So this is just one, literally one snapshot of one day of coverage that we have. Um, the next day or the next week, the lead story could be something on immigration, and the five down here could be something on gun policy or on public education or on women's health and things like that. So. Uh, just a, a picture, this is uh, the, a picture of the Texas House of Representatives at the state capitol. Um, they meet, like I said, every five months, uh, or five months every two years. So every odd number of year, it means the legislative session is in. They meet um, the second Tuesday in January, and they run the, through um, Memorial Day, the first uh, the first Tuesday after Memorial Day, um, which is late May. Which is in late May. So, and that's that's required by the Constitution. They can only meet for 140 days. 40 days. 140 days. Um, <clears throat> and the only thing they're required to pass by, uh, according to the Constitution, is the budget. They could go in and they could pass the budget and they could leave, but unfortunately they have a lot of time on their hands to make and pass crazy legislation. Um, and the only person that can call them back for a special legislative session is the governor of Texas, so he has to make an official declaration where they call everybody in. And those can run up to 30 days, and he can call an unlimited number of those. So, for example, in 2014, um, excuse me, in 2018, Governor Perry, 2011, uh, before Governor Perry, our former governor, was going to run for president, he had two back-to-back -back, uh, emergency sessions uh, to pass legislation. Um, it's annoying for people to have to go back and cover it because the, during the regular session, they can't pass anything for the first 60 days. So we went to Parliament yesterday, and people were saying, well, we're sorry, it's a little boring. They're just kind of standing around. It's like, well, we're used to that because they do a lot of standing around in Texas also. Um, unless an item is declared a, a, an emergency session, um, an emergency item, then the lawmakers cannot pass it. They can file bills, but they cannot actually vote things out for the first 60, set, uh, 60 days. Um, but it also works differently than when y'all, because we understand all the ministers were named yesterday and they started, you know, immediately debating proposals. That's not the way it works in Texas for some reason, but that's all governed by the Constitution the way it's been done since the 1800s. 
Uh, just again, uh, to show that our activity out in the field, this is our former colleague Morgan Smith who was doing a project on sex trafficking in Texas and she's interviewing somebody here in a state prison. These are our two colleagues that were, um, it looks like they're on the crane here in the middle of uh, Harris County or outside of Houston doing some stories after the Hurricane Harvey um, disaster. Um, and that's a group of us, yeah, I think we were in Oaxaca in southern Mexico there. Um, I joked that I was trying to figure out how to use that camera because I'm not good at stuff like that, but we were doing a big project on the immigration crisis um, and pretty much wanted to go down there to see why people were leaving these villages and these areas, why they were crossing from Central America into Mexico illegally and riding on trains or buses or hitchhiking through the most dangerous parts of Mexico to try to get to the border. So that's where this picture is taken. So these are, uh, like, I, like we mentioned before, we cover various breaking news. Uh, we, our beat reporters are covering various enterprise stories, and we do some investigative journalism as well. Just a couple of examples of what we do uh, you know, project-wise. Uh, on the left is a project that we worked on with uh, another investigative outlet, ProPublica, uh, looking at the flooding risks in Houston. This story was actually written in December 2016 and Hurricane Harvey hit and flooded uh, most of Houston in August of 2017. So this was, you know, the reporting that we did was very prescient in terms of showing why Houston flooded the way it did. Uh, we did a story, in 20, uh, a series of stories in 2016 on police shootings. In, uh, in the United States, there was a huge national conversation about shootings by police, and, uh, you know, we needed to, we wanted to localize it. We wanted to have that bring the conversation to Texas because uh, we no one there was no ever there was never any data that was localized to ter determine whether there was you know what the issues were when it came to police shootings in in Texas and the biggest uh, conclusion that we got out of that was that the reporting about shootings by police is is very poor um, the reporting uh, of the, what's required of police departments to report there's a lot of gaps in the reporting uh, with, when it comes to police shootings. And so we kind of brought some accountability to that and localized a national story. Um, and then, of course, uh, Julian is based in El Paso. You can talk more about what happened there a couple of weeks ago. That, that, was, that was just the, the, the initial sh uh, story on the shooting um, at the Walmart, uh, which was uh, two and a half blocks away from, from the high school I went to. That couple, actually, that's, that's uh, embracing there, they heard the shots and they ran to the back and they were told to exit the rear exit and they were, went into a storage container in the parking lot of this Walmart and I think that day was probably 103 degrees so you can imagine you know hearing gunshots running out of a supermarket and then being able being forced to stay in a, in a hot storage shed for 20 minutes but like I said earlier that was the initial story just you know, this is what happened this is what the police are saying that we kept adding to throughout the day and that um, you know inspired at least a dozen more stories uh, based on, you know, that talked about, you know, how the gunman got his weapon, what laws allowed him to do that, what lawmakers were going to do in the future to try to prevent anything. Short answer is probably nothing. Um, and uh, again, because this was a, a racially motivated uh, attack, you know, then it also led to stories and discussions about immigration policy and, and the rhetoric uh, surrounding uh, mainly Hispanic migrants that are trying to to either um, leave a place where they live to seek asylum here, or Mexican Americans that are living in Texas and have been living in Texas for generations. Um, uh, some more stuff, you know, more examples of, of how we try to diversify our content to keep people interested and keep, you know, offering some new products. Uh, video lawmakers <laughs> fight uh, in the Texas House of Immigration protest. This was the last day of, of the previous legislative session, um, where the last day of the session is usually ceremonial, everybody brings their families and they're, you know, it's supposed to be like, okay, we're done, this is a crazy business, because like I said, the first 60 days they don't really do anything, and all of a sudden it seems like they wake up in April and they're like, oh wow, we have so much work to do, so you get the 12 hour days, the 14 hour days, so the last day is supposed to be just this big moment to exhale and to everybody, you know, it's done. Uh, this was a, <laughs> a rare moment where these, there were protesters in the gallery that did not like the immigration proposals that were signed by the governor. Um, or that were, that were passed by the governor and were eventually signed by the governor. And uh, what happened is that this uh, really conservative lawmaker from uh, outside of Dallas um, told a, law, a Hispanic lawmaker that he was going to call immigration on the protesters in the gallery. And mo most of the protesters in the gallery were American citizens. They just happened to be Latino. So that just led to a shoving match and they had to be separated. So, um, you know, it was people were comparing it to the way the Congress in Mexico works. Sometimes they actually get the shoving matches. but. 
that got a lot of attention, not because people like the sensational aspect of it. They do, but because of the policies that they, they were talking about. So we'll have smaller videos. Sometimes they're two to three minutes embedded in, in our text, just, again, to mix it up a little bit, you know, to have people, give the people the ability to, to, after reading something, to have something more visual. Campaign finance is a huge part of what we cover. Um, thankfully, it's easy to get this data. They have specific deadlines, so our data group, you know, knows that this data is coming, so they're ready to, to scrape it all and to make it a nice, neat, you know, package um, to show how people can... Do you check those figures if all of them have came from the sources? These are taken from, uh, from campaign filings, so they go through the Elections Commission. So these are officially from official filings. This is not from the campaigns themselves. Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Were there any proceedings of contested filings probably some candidate and source <coughs> from an entrance parent and low food sources? I'm not sure I understand. Can you say that again? <coughs> Sorry. In Ukraine, we have lots of this going on. So the country, the, the parties are only starting to build up their like, transparent financing, uh, financing in a transparent way, because previously they used to be financed by oligarchs, and this, these monies were never published, actually. And yeah. now they, they, they are forced to you know, publish this information, but it often being questioned as yeah. to the lawfulness of the sources, right. and they often claim that this money has been donated by the common people in small amounts, and then uh, the investigators find out that actually the people who are listed on the donators list hear, hear this for the first time, yeah. uh, like a um, simple cashier in a supermarket has donated some 30,000 free message is <laughs> the three months pay which is quite unnatural. So do you have this so, happening in the US? Yes, but in, in a different way. So there are different rules on campaign finance for, on a state level and on a federal level. So on a state level, uh, there's, a, uh, there's, there's it's, it's unlimited, I think, in terms of what you can donate uh, to candidates. And so uh, you know, officials themselves have to file financial disclosures uh, uh, and uh, they have to be detailed on on that. And quite, you know, we've we've definitely done some reporting where we found that there were things. Uh, you know, our attorney general, uh, he was uh, uh, he was you know, he, he was actually working as in, in terms of like recommending securities trades for for certain uh, people, right? And uh, in violation of what he was supposed to be able to do. And so we got that off of a source. You know, so he you know he had to kind of remake some redo some filings. Uh, but uh, you know the, the main thing is uh, th you know with the establishment of these political action committees, and that's where a lot of the big money now is coming through, and that's what a lot of folks refer to as dark money. So you're not able to tell as much uh, about who is funding these uh, these political action committees, and they're you know they're on the federal level, and they're also some on the state. I think I think uh, there has to be more disclosure on the state level. I think we feel like we have pretty good campaign finance disclosure laws in Texas, but the federal laws. They provide for a lot of uh, the, there's a lot more gray area in terms of who's 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 putting money into that, and there is a, a pretty famous Supreme Court decision in the U.S. a few years ago called that's known as Citizens United, and that basically allowed for these political action cam, 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 uh, committees to kind of you know raise this money and not have to disclose all the fund uh, all the donors, and so that's kind of disrupted our campaign finance system. Uh, have you any project of investigative journalism, uh, you know, to fight corruption, to drain the swamp? Uh, projects were uh, on uh, looking at corruption. A few years ago, we uh, did a big project. Maybe we can talk about uh, the business as usual. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what we, if we keep going, we'll yeah. get to the investigation. Yeah. Part, but yeah, we, we have several projects that take sometimes two months, sometimes a half a year. Um, this is a... Uh, Public data is a, is a big uh, part of our of our of what we do here, so we'll get the information and again we'll put it on the site so people don't have to search for it. This is probably our most uh, popular um, data tool here. This is this shows what people make with taxpayer money. Um, so, and w I was speaking earlier this week and I told people that it surprised a lot of us that we, I was getting phone calls, for example, from a school teacher that was very angry with the Texas Tribune because the information about his salary was made public 
Um, and it was up to us to explain to them, well, you should know that you're paid through taxpayer money, so that's publicly available as it should be. Um, and ian has been making the point that uh, <laughs> one of the highest paid people in the university, or excuse me, in Texas is part of the athletic department at a major university. You would think it would be somebody that's doing something that pe people consider more important, but college sports it has, it's a money maker, it's very influential, it's, you know, it's even how some students decide to go to school. So this, we, we don't have every single entity, but we do a pretty good job of, of updating this information. So we have the biggest school districts, the biggest public universities, and, and the biggest public agencies. Um, I've actually, you know, searched to see how much my brother was making as a school teacher just, you know, so I could tell him to buy mom better gifts at Christmas or something like that. So um, it's pretty handy for, for a lot of reasons. Um, again, that's just one component of our, of our data there. Are there any alternative engines to retrieve the same information? I mean, parts of the, the same information. Treasury, treasury office like portal or information. Uh, not in any kind of searchable online database. Uh, and where do, where do you source this information? We get it straight from the state comptroller's office. They're the head of the budget. Uh, they oversee the. They have oversee the execution of the state budget. Uh, any salaries that are paid out by the state is going kind of through their office, and so. That's the primary source of data. A lot of these, we file public records requests with individual universities, individual state agencies. They are required to submit this data um, through open records law, and it's all overseen by the comptroller's office. Uh, so do they submit them automatically, or they submit them on request? On request. They don't do anything automatically. <laughs> uh, is it otherwise publicly available? So if I'm not a media but I'm an investigative journalist, freelancer, so I can... John or Jane Q. Citizen can request information from the government and they're supposed to be able to get it. Yeah, anybody. It doesn't, you don't have to be a journalist. You don't have to show a specific license or a specific degree or anything. I mean, you know, if I was in the reporter and I took a class on open records laws, I could request government information. And a lot of people, a lot of people do that and, you know, think that there's something wrong here. Just like I don't have to be a journalist to get a court record if it's publicly available. Uh, a lot of people will know that they can get these documents themselves. Uh, and the court records are available. Yeah, it, I mean, not all through the same through the same means, but if they're if they're uh, scanned, if it's a matter of public record, if some some things are redacted, some things are sealed, depending on investigations and things like that. But usually, court documents you should be able to find either at the uh, the county clerk's office or at the federal clerk's office. In Ukraine, court circuits are closed. Uh, by the way, can you tell uh, about uh, uh, particularities of uh, court journalism and maybe uh, uh, court journalism in uh, your pro um, uh, news source? We don't have a court reporter. We mm -hmm. other other newspapers and publications do, but we've all had to go to court to cover something related to our beat. Um, it just it depends. Again, like I said, at the federal level. If somebody is, com is convicted of a crime and they're waiting sentencing, then they have a pre-sentencing uh, pre investigation report. Oftentimes, the details of those are sealed until the verdict or until the, the punishment is handed down. If it deals with some sort of civil litigation or some sort of dispute between businesses or entities like that, some of the information can be redacted. Um, if there's an ongoing investigation where some of the information is made public in the criminal court at the federal level, but there's somebody that's cooperating, uh, as an informant or as a cooperating witness that was also involved, but now they're trying to cooperate so um, they can lessen his or her sentence. Sometimes those names are not published. They, they just call them CS1, CS2, um, or CI1, cooperating informant 1, cooperating informant 2, and things like that. So there are different levels and different degrees of what is public and what's not. We've requested documents that are redacted so much where it's just one sheet with a line and the rest is black. Other times, other agencies are very transparent and they give us exactly what we need. It just depends on what the nature of, of the request is. Uh, have you any uh, hugely covered uh, court processes last time um, in Texas? Uh, like I said, we don't have somebody that's that, like I do immigration, we don't have somebody that just sits in courts and covers only courts um, because there are so many different federal courts and state courts in Texas. But if it pertains to something that is on our beat, um, then we will, for example, I will sit in immigration court, which is it's different than a criminal procedure to civil matter, but I will sit there just to see what the process is like. If there was a, a conflict involving um, a state agency that's being taken to a criminal court or a civil court at the state level, then we'll send whoever is involved in that particular area, then he or she will sit there and, and try to cover that as best they can as well. But, but how do you get to the cities? Is it by default 
open to do journalist or you need to accredit uh, in advance? It, they, it should be an open process. It should be an open court process. In immigration, because it's civil, they use that as an excuse to, to not have people, this is just a new phenomenon in El Paso Immigration Court where they say there's not enough seating um, or they, they don't let the media in. But no, court, uh, you know, as, as a matter of practice historically is, is a public, is, it's, it's an open procedure. And, and for things like bigger cases like federal appeals courts, you have access but you have to apply to right. make sure you get a spot uh, early in advance. And same thing with the U.S. Supreme Court. We've covered Supreme Court cases. Uh, you have to apply uh, usually with a letter from your supervisor to get access uh, early on. It's supposed to be open, but they do say limited spots, so oftentimes you have to apply for a and, spot. And, and other aspects. So you, you can get in, but are you automatically allowed to film and pitch everything? Yeah, not automatically, no. So, for example, <laughs> the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans that covers Texas, all the federal courts in Texas, um, again, like Ian said, I have to I have to email or call the clerk, I have to request, I have to submit, submit a letter from my editors proving that I'm a journalist, and then I'll get permission to be in there. But I cannot take my recorder, I cannot take a camera. It's very old school where I have to take my notepad and a pen and try to read my horrible handwriting after after the proceedings. The same thing with the Supreme Court. Um, I mean, they, they scan you security when you get into the building, and then they scan you again when you actually get to the to the Supreme Court. Um, and again, there's limited seats, so you have to you have to get there. It's like getting concert tickets where you camp out overnight, right? I mean, you have to get there early just to make sure that there's available space. So, okay. the, the, the process is pretty comparable to what we have. Okay. Is it? Uh, oh. By the way, we have court records which are searchable. Yeah. We heard about that you have a, actually have a much better database yeah. than we probably do for court records. And, and there are other databases like LexisNexis or things like that yeah. that, we'll, that we can also search. And they, it's subscription-based, so we have to pay for it. And then court records, if you want copies, sometimes we'll have to pay a certain amount as well. Um, but it should be, most of the stuff should be available online. Uh, can you tell a little about uh, famous cases or just name it? Famous cases that we've covered? Uh, what do you want to talk about, uh, voter, voter ID? The voter ID law that, that went to court a lot, that was, that was something that the legislature passed in 2011. Uh, they required a specific type of ID for people to be able to, to vote before all you had to take was your voter registration card or your ID. That's controversial because, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, you need an ID to buy a pack of cigarettes or buy a six pack of beer. Why not just have an ID? Well, it's, it, and I, you know, to admit, I thought, you know, the same thing as well until you figure out who doesn't have an ID, for example. Um, if they're in a, in a primary for a small house district, if a lot of the votes come from a, an old folks retirement home where these people have been there a long time, the, that's a, a population that votes a lot. But they don't need a driver's license because they haven't driven a car in 15 years. And, you know, um, or if I'm a student from Oklahoma and I go to the University of Texas but I have my Oklahoma State driver's license because maybe my insurance for my automobile is still under my dad's name or my mom's name. Um, maybe, you know, I, don't, I only have a P.O. box at the university so I still have my Oklahoma driver's license. I would not be able to vote in Texas because I don't have a state-issued ID. If I'm a woman who just was recently married, hasn't changed my, my maiden name to my married name on my ID, or did change it at the registrar's office, but they didn't update their database, uh, sometimes she might not be able to vote. So there are certain, er uh, certain discrepancies. So that lawsuit drug on for a very, very, very long time. So there was the, that's just one example of things that we've covered. Um, deferred action for childhood arrivals. Uh, DACA that uh, the President Obama passed. That's that's getting ready to go to the Supreme Court, so we'll probably be there. That's an immigration issue again. So these are just two examples of things that we've done. When, when President Obama was in office, uh, our pre our previous Attorney General and now our Governor used to love to say, "I wake up in the morning and I find a way to sue the federal government." Uh, they were very uh, there was very various lawsuits that we covered, especially then about. Uh, the fight between Texas and the federal government, uh, issues over the uh, Affordable Health Care Act, we covered that. We covered issues about uh, redistricting, the drawing of political districts. That still continues to be an issue that's in the, you know, just got resolved. The, the federal case that we've been covering just got uh, uh, overturned in terms of uh, the act of gerrymandering, um, although that, that's going to be uh, an issue moving forward. The, the whole idea of drawing political dis uh, districts for political purposes, you know, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's supposed to be legal to draw for political, like to, to just you know to draw to help your party, but it's illegal under the Voting Rights Act to uh, to draw a district that discriminates against people of color, and so quite often uh, the the drawing of districts that hurt Democrats were actually hurting people of color in their voting power, and so the lawsuit was basically about whether that was actually discrimination, and so. The Supreme Court ruled that uh, 
they didn't have the power to determine that. And so basically it kind of has allowed that kind of practice to continue. So, but that's not going away. But there'll be another case related to that. And how intense is the fighting between the states and federal layers in terms of taxation? So there, there are lots of, um, you know, dis discontent, US wide claiming that the federals are becoming are even ex are more expensive. So that they weren't supposed to raise that much tax at the federal level initially. Or yeah. Is it very intense in Texas? Uh, it was it was particularly intense when the Obama administration was there because of uh, the uh, idea that well it was it was the fights were also mostly mostly over regulation which kind of led to you know fees and charges and stuff whether it was environmental they thought you know the uh, the Obama administration was inflicting too many regulations that cost uh, companies too much money uh, they you know the Obama administration even even though tax levels were lower than they were uh, 20 years ago, uh, they still there was still a fight that, the, that, that there was not a there's too much taxing of the top uh, income bracket. I mean, it's, it's primarily been regulation. You know, where, whether it's climate, whether it's healthcare, um, those are the issues that were kind of Texas was fighting against. Now, with the Trump administration, there hasn't been as much uh, complaining from Texas, at least from the statewide level, about taxation because I think he cut uh, the that they cut the tax rate for kind of the, the, you know, the top bracket, which is, the, the, which is now we're starting to feel the effects. I think it's whether it's actually going to try to trickle down and, and, and impact uh, lower tax brackets. But uh, you don't hear as much complaining from Texas right now because the state, the, state, uh, the people in charge of our state are allied pretty closely with Trump. And you've been covering these issues. Somewhat. So, you know, we, 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 uh, we do more of the kind of the state policy aspect of it. Uh, we try to localize some of this, like with, with Julian, we uh, try to get more of the impact of these policies. So we're covering, we're definitely covering things like redistricting the impact of, of that and some of these uh, federal decisions on health care and stuff like that. Uh, and so eventually we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to be covering some more impact on, on the economy uh, as kind of we see it. You know, a lot of people are anticipating that the economy is about to take a turn, so that's going to impact us, of course. So we'll have more of that as it as it comes. So, for example, yesterday or the day before, I forget where in the United States, the Trump administration announced it was rolling back policies that Obama put into place with respect to greenhouse emissions that affect the environment. So the president, the current president, rolled back those. So that was a story that we did cover because obviously that affects Texas in a big way. So. You want to keep going? Yeah, I think we're going into the, the slides going to audience next, I think. I was wondering if we should just talk quickly about investigative uh, projects to answer your question, which, uh, and corruption, which, uh, so in, in state officials and state elected officials in the legislature and, and in statewide office have to file certain campaign uh, documents with, uh, with this Texas Ele uh, Ethics Commission. And so those forms we, we request in bulk uh, and uh, download them and we post them on our site. So for each, you have, each lawmaker has a page on our site and you can download this as a PDF to see the form that they filed and the, and the, uh, and, and the disclosures that they make in terms of who gave uh, them campaigns. This is tricky because you can, you know, you can have uh, campaign forms for yourself and for entities like our governor's name is Greg Abbott. You can file as Greg Abbott. You can file as Texans to elect Greg Abbott. So there's multiple disclosure forms that we have to kind of search for. So we get those in bulk and kind of, uh, we have people who kind of, you know, reporters who are kind of screening those and looking, looking for conflicts of interest. We had a big project that we did a few years ago uh, that we called uh, Business as Usual or Business as Usual where we kind of looked at issues of ethics, you know, uh, in terms of breaking down our, our state representation leg legislature by the profession they do, by the profession they have, whether they're lawyers or re in real estate or bankers, and then kind of showing the legislation that they sponsor to show that they had a vested interest uh, in those uh, in those fields. For example, we had a uh, you know someone who was in the payday lend lending industry, which is an industry that works on like smaller loans for uh, poor people and charge them. We charge they charge exorbitant rates of interest. Uh, on those loans, and so one of the kind of the you know one of the key voices in like payday lending legislation was someone who was had payday lending businesses, so it was a clear conflict of interest. So we do, we've done a lot of that stuff. I think one of the most interesting investigations, you know, maybe you want to talk about the one that the TADC 
Oh, my, uh, so my colleague, uh, Jay Root, he got a tip from somebody that works at the Texas Alcohol and Beverage Commission, which is the state agency that regulates uh, how late the bars are open, what time you can start selling beer, you know, how old you have to be, and things like that. And he got uh, an inside tip that this, the, the leaders of this agency were actually going um, to California uh, on a junket to go party, you know, at a convention um, under the guise of, of, you know, official work travel. Um, and they even made a flyer um, superimposing their, their faces uh, on a jet saying, woohoo, here we go, you know, with like holding a six pack of beer. So they used that on state property. They used money to, to travel there. And it was a big investigation that actually uh, ended up with the entire board um, being replaced or, or resigning themselves. So that's just one example of, um, you know, how you can get what we call whistleblowers inside an agency that are actually good proponents of good government saying, hey, this is not supposed to be going on, you know, you guys need to do something about it. So um, those, oftentimes those, those things happen where one of those stories just ends up, you know, sort of exploding and it was, uh, I think, really irresponsible for them to be so adamant about what they were doing. Um, another uh, investigation or another, I guess, series of stories uh, our colleague Alexa Uda did with the Attorney General sent out a press release saying that there was um, so many thousands of people that were on the voter rolls that should not be because they were not U.S. citizens. What would happen is when they got their driver's license and registered uh, with the Texas Department of Public Safety to either get their ID cards or driver's licenses, they were legal residents. And at the time, um, during over the course of time, they had become U.S. citizens. It's just the state agencies didn't update their own roles yet. Um, so a lot of people took this press release and ran with the story, uh, but it took a little bit more digging to realize, like, no, wait a minute, this is not what's happening. Uh, the Secretary of State, who is in charge with the with uh, the elections department, uh, he got and he took a lot of heat for it, and he ended up not being confirmed by the Texas Senate. Um, and so now there's a new Secretary of State, but the gentleman that was that made this uh, what a lot of people are calling an error. I think he was appointed to another position within the governor's office anyway, but um, it was just a good example of, of, you know, taking information that seemed a little bit suspicious and then digging and digging and digging a little bit because a lot of these people might have been disenfranchised. We had people that we knew personally that were either sources or lobbyists or people that worked in the Capitol that were legal immigrants at the time they got their driver's licenses and then had been U.S. citizens, and they got one of the same letters saying, you know, you're not supposed to be on the voter roll because you're, you know, you're not a citizen yet. And they were like, no, 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 I am. I took my oath. It's just the fact that you guys hadn't updated your information yet. So. Uh, you just mentioned that you're not chasing uh, sensational headlines and take time to prove and check the facts. Uh, and all of your competitors do the same? Well, but the, the example I just gave is where, you know, we didn't immediately just rewrite the press release from the Attorney General's office. You know, we, it took time to do a little bit more digging and things like that. So whether the people saw it as breaking news, whether some people said it was sensational or not, that example is just to point the fact that we, we paused a little bit before we got the story out there to beat everybody else so we could do a little bit more, more digging. And I think with respect to even though their colleagues and competitors are still respected journalists, I think a lot of the news outlets in, in, the, in the state do the same thing. They'll, they'll say, wait a minute. I mean, there's been other, other organizations that have had really, really good stories where in the office were like, we wish we could have had that, you know, what happened, or maybe they have better choices, or maybe you know, there was something that we missed that they didn't. Frankly, the sensational headlines and stuff come from a lot of news outlets covering Texas from outside of the state. Uh, there's, you know, as far as within the state, we're, 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 we have a pretty responsible group of uh, uh, news organizations, but a lot of these uh, organizations that uh, have their slant and bias, whether it's to the left or to the right, uh, they're, they're using the issues that we cover, and kind of put their slant on it, and those are the ones that are just more sensationalistic, I think. The news outlets that we mentioned earlier are all quite responsible and, and report out. I mean, the ones that write the sensational headlines in Texas are kind of these, uh, are a lot of organizations that are not necessarily journalism organizations. They may purport themselves to be, but they're more of the advocacy, uh, you know, trying to, you know, uh, trying to uh, bend policy towards a certain way, which none of these, uh, you know, media organizations that we talked about do, do that. And you don't feel any audience churn because of your family story. Hi. Uh, we have an event here. Oh, uh, we, oh my gosh, we're out of our system. Jeez. Sorry, oh. to interrupt you. <laughs> wow, okay. Yeah, I kind of figured out what the story is. It starts. Okay, we will. We have five minutes. Okay, we will wrap up in five minutes. <laughs> Should we continue this at a bar somewhere? Or? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, let's, let's quickly talk about audience since you mentioned that. Uh, 
I think we mentioned that we probably allow people to republish our content for free. Um, this is just an example of, we have a message, there's a message board in the US, I don't know if it's accessible here, Reddit. This is just, uh, this is used by a lot of, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's a, it tend, tends to be more of a younger audience here, and they, you know, a lot, it's a lot of it's message boards which allows us to do Q and A's, which we do. Of, we'll do specific topics to, like this one, we did a Q and A about marijuana policy in, in Texas, which and you're using social networks to engage. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll have a channel on Facebook to say, hey Texans, what are you concerned about? You know, so it's kind of a check on us, like, hey, what are we not covering that you guys want to learn more about at state level? So I'll just quickly mention, you know, we do kind of analyze our traffic in different ways using Google Analytics for kind of our more historical traffic, Parsley, which is a paid service that we use to kind of get uh, traffic stats in the moment. Um, there is a Facebook uh, uh, metric that we can use to track our Facebook reach. Um, we share all of our content when we say share on social media like Twitter and Facebook. We'll use Sprout, which kind of helps put a tracker in the links that we send out so we can see who shared our content. And we collect our membership data in a program, it's a paid program called Salesforce that just allows us to kind of track information and engage with them better. And we give the Salesforce CRM? Yeah, yeah, it's like a CRM. All right, I'll keep going. And you mentioned the Facebook group. Right? So this is where we just kind of do a topic every month to kind of engage, uh, you know, it's a very, you know, a very concentrated group of people who are really wanting to kind of deep and share their expertise as well as kind of hear from our reporters. Uh, we do explanatory journalism quite often we, you know, in terms of like things that you were talking about in terms of making sure we're not having audience churn is that we're trying to keep a two-way conversation going so audience uh, members will, uh, will submit questions to us about particular things that they're interested in and if it's not a specific story that we write we will try to do these things that we call text planners where we ask, answer questions as simple as how do I register to vote? Uh, things like that. That's how, what we do. How a bill becomes a law. How, how do I register my car insurance? Why can't I buy beer on Sundays? You know, things like that. Really important things. <laughs> we talked about our events. This is just kind of an example of the different types of crowds we have at events. We have a big event that's happening. I think you already talked about the festival, right? So I'll keep going. All right. The, th the part we have to rush through is how do we pay for all of this? So we'll quickly just. This is just a quick slide of just kind of what we've raised up to date. As you can see, the main thing to take away from this is that we don't rely on one, uh, one source of revenue uh, above all else. We try to split this up as much as we can so we're not, you know, we're as diversified as possible. That's just a quick breakdown of our revenue budget. I'll give a second if anyone wants to take a picture of that. Absolutely. The point here is that if any one of these fell through, we would not go under because we don't rely on just one single source. We take a hit, but we wouldn't have the bolt immediately. We're pretty aggressive in terms of seeking sponsorship for particular products or things that we do, because we have you know clear editorial guidelines that won't let allow that to affect any of the journalism we produce. But for example, our election coverage, we you know our our development team will seek sponsors for that. We have a video series. This was a video debate series during the campaign season that we had a sponsor for. We have these newsletters that are roundups uh, of, uh, of our coverage you know, we, that we do you know, monthly digests. And so uh, we, we seek out sponsors for those. And then I mentioned, I think uh, we have a political newsletter that's for insiders. That's a paid product, but it's also got uh, sponsor messages within that, as well as uh, I think Julian mentioned kind of our op-ed site, our opinion site. That's where we kind of played with paid placement ads, like that sponsor content ad that you see. And uh, we're uh, sorry, we have to okay. All right. And so we have the foundation support as well. Yeah. Well, thanks. All right. Uh, it's my newspaper. Oh, okay. Thanks. It's not uh, all Ukrainian. Uh, newspaper. Thank I bring you very much, guys. Yeah, sorry, I got cut off.